my uh, pleasure uh, now to introduce our keynote speaker, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist George Will. Uh, George, I might add, won the uh, Pulitzer for commentary back in uh, 1977 when there were actually competition among journalists. It, has, it hadn't become an award of attrition. Uh, George uh, now writes his uh, twice weekly column for the Washington Post, which is syndicated in 450 newspapers around uh, the country. That is all the more remarkable when you consider that there are probably no more than 350 papers left in the nation. Um, George also writes a column for Newsweek. For how much longer, who knows? Uh, he is also a regular commentator on ABC's This Week, uh, which, uh, as far as I can tell, is the only reason to tune into This Week, unless, of course, you find Katrina Vanden Heuvel's witty put downs of capitalism compelling television, uh, and I don't. Uh, George has authored many books on politics and political philosophy over the years, including, I think, some seven collections of his essays. It's all very compelling reading. His most recent book, however, uh, came out last month, a reprint of his classic book, uh, Men at Work, The Craft of Baseball. Uh, many consider the best, this is the best book ever written about baseball. And the reason it can be reprinted two decades after it's fir it first came out is because while players change, the nuances and subtleties of baseball do not. A few understand these subtleties better than George will. Uh, for instance, things like whether the pitcher is going to throw a curveball or a changeup or a fastball, what the count is, how fast the runner on first is, how many pitches the pitcher's thrown, what the score of the game is, all determines where people take a position on the field, infielders and outfielders. If you understand the subtleties of baseball, you enjoy the game much more. I've often said that if uh, ice hockey had any subtleties, it might be worth watching, but um, <laughs> it doesn't, so it isn't. Um, Uh, if I could uh, digress just a minute to talk about me instead of George, uh, I, I played a little baseball in college myself, and so I know something about the game, and I was pretty good. I actually believe I could have been a major league baseball player were it not for the fact that I'm too intelligent to hit a curveball. Uh, no, I'm not joking. I mean, you either have to have the reflexes of Ted Williams, which nobody has, or you have to have an IQ that renders you essentially indifferent as to whether a ball coming at your head at 83 miles an hour is going to break or not. <laughs> I was not indifferent, and that pretty much ended my career when the pitchers <laughs> found that out. George is a serious Cubs fan, and I mean serious, which means he'll never root for a team in the World Series. Uh, <clears throat> but baseball is not why we invited George. He is without doubt one of the most perceptive analysts of the political scene extant, and not just bare-buckled politics, bare-knuckled politics, but public policy and political philosophy. Indeed, uh, when the world uh, gained a great journalist, it lost a potential first-rate scholar. Good trade-off in my view. Uh, George has a master's degree from Oxford University and a master's and PhD in political science from Princeton. Uh, before going into journalism, he taught of philosophy at Michigan State University and the University of Toronto. He's lectured at Harvard, He's a smart guy. Uh, among the many reasons I admire George is his support for term limits, his eye for the hypocrisy of the chicken little environmentalist, and his understanding that campaign finance reform invariably boils down to incumbent protection. And of course, he is a craftsman with the English language, a pleasure to read even on those rare occasions when you disagree with him. So please welcome a true American treasure, Pulitzer Prize winner, George Will. Thank you very much. Yes, someone once said that the Chicago Cubs are to the World Series as the Tenth Amendment is to constitutional law. Of <laughs> Of, of rare and inconsequential appearance. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ed, for that uh, generous introduction that proves that not all forms of inflation are painful. <laughs> it put me in mind of the Renaissance Pope who used to travel about Rome 
being greeted by crowds with cries of Deus es, Deus es, thou art God, thou art God. The Pope said it's a trifle strong, but really very pleasant. <laughs> I want to thank all of the people in this room uh, for making Cato and its work possible. And, and I want to thank a few million more people who in recent weeks have toiled to demonstrate in a timely manner why Cato is necessary. I refer, of course, to the people of Greece. <laughs> Milton Friedman, whose name we honor tonight, uh, was honored often for his recondite and subtle scholarship but it was complemented by a sturdy common sense, much in fashion nowhere now. About 40 years ago, he found himself in an Asian country where the government was extremely eager to show off a public works project of which it was inordinately and excessively fond. It was digging a canal. And they took Milton out to see this, and he was astonished because there were hordes of workers but no heavy earth moving equipment. And he remarked upon this to his government guide, and the man said, well, Mr. Friedman, you don't understand. This is a jobs program. That's why we only have men with shovels. To which Friedman said, well, if it's a jobs program, why don't they have spoons instead of shovels? <laughs> the, the attempt to educate the world to the principles of rationality and liberty never ends. It began in earnest for a lot of us in 1962 with the publication of Capitalism and Freedom. In 1964, two years later, we got a demonstration of how urgent it was to have that book when Lyndon Johnson, campaigning for president, said, we're in favor of a lot of things and we're against mighty few. <laughs> well, the man running against him at that time, in 1964, was, of course, Barry Goldwater, who to the superficial observer seemed to lose because he only carried 44 states. When the final votes were tabulated 16 years later, however, it was clear that he had won. However, it was a contingent victory. In 2007, per capita welfare state spending, per capita welfare state spending, adjusted for inflation, was 70% higher than it had been when Ronald Reagan was inaugurated 27 years earlier. The trend continues and the trend is ominous. 51 days ago now, the president signed into law the health care reform, the great lunge to complete the New Deal project and the Great Society project, the great lunge to make us more European. At exactly the moment that this is done, the European Ponzi scheme of the social welfare state is being revealed for what it is. There is a difference. We are not Europeans. We are not, in Orwell's phrase, a state-broken people. We do not have a feudal background of subservience to the state. No, that is the project of the current administration. It can be boiled down to learned feudalism. It is a dependency agenda that I have been talking about ad nauseum. Two recent examples. When the government took over student loans, making it the case that now the two most important financial transactions of the average family, get a housing mortgage and a loan for college tuitions, will now be transactions with the government, they included a provision in the student loan legislation that said there will be special forgiveness of student loans for those who go in to work for the government or for nonprofits. One third of the recent stimulus was devoted to preserving unionized public employees' jobs in states and localities. And so it goes. The agenda is constant. In 1965, with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the final dissolution in some ways of the sense of restraint on the part of the federal government, it was advertised as aid for the poorest of the poor. Ten years later, in 1975, 80% of all school districts were participating in this. It is a principle of liberal social legislation that a program for the poor is a poor program. The assumption is, the assumption is that middle class Americans will not support a program aimed only for the poor. That is a theory refuted by the fact that the earned income tax credit 
supported and expanded by Ronald Reagan, is extremely popular in this country. But it does reveal the fact that dependency is the agenda of the other side. It is the agenda to make more and more people dependent in more and more things on the government. Well, we can now see today in the headlines from Europe where that leads. It leads to the streets of Athens, where we had described by media as anti-government mobs. The anti-government mobs were composed almost entirely of government employees. <laughs> the Greeks the Greeks and the Europeans have said all along, as they increased the weight of the state on, in danger of suffocating the economy, so far, so good, they kept saying, so far, so good. Reminds me of everything does sooner or later a baseball story. True story, in 1951, Warren Spahn, on the way to becoming the winningest left-handed pitcher in the history of baseball, was pitching for the then Boston Braves against the then New York Giants in the then Polo Grounds. And the Giants sent up to the plate a rookie who was 0 for 12. It was clear this kid would never hit big league pitching. It was some kid named Willie Mays. <laughs> Spawn stood out on the mound, 60 feet, 6 inches from home plate, threw the ball to Mays, crushed it. First hit, first home run. After the game, the sports writers went up to Spawn in the clubhouse and said, Spawny, what happened? Spawn said, gentlemen, for the first 60 feet, that was a hell of a pitch. It's not good enough in baseball, and it's not good enough in governance either. Let me give you a sense, of a framework to understand this extraordinarily interesting moment in which we live. I believe that today, as has been the case for 100 years, and as will be the case for the foreseeable future, the American political argument is an argument between two Princetonians. James Madison of the class of 1771 and Thomas Woodrow Wilson of the class of 1879. I firmly believe that the most important decision taken anywhere in the 20th century was the decision taken as to where to locate the Princeton Graduate College. President of Princeton, Woodrow Wilson, wanted it located down on the campus. Other people wanted it located where it, in fact, is, up on the golf course away from the campus. When Wilson lost that, he had one of his characteristic tantrums, went into politics, and ruined the 20th century. I'm, <laughs> I'm simplifying a bit. Madison asserted that politics should take its bearings from nature, from human nature, and the natural rights with which we are endowed that pre-exist government. Woodrow Wilson, like all people steeped in the 19th century discovery, they, or so they thought that history is a proper noun with a capital H, that history has a mind and life of its own. He argued that human nature is as malleable and changeable as history itself, and that it is the job of the state to regulate and guide the evolution of human nature and the changeable nature of the rights we are owed by the government that, in his view, dispensed rights. Heraclitus famously said, you cannot step into the same river twice, meaning that the river would change. The modern progressive believes that you can't step into the same river twice because you change constantly. Well, those of us of the Madisonian persuasion believe that we take our bearings from a certain constancy, not from, well, to coin a phrase, the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. That has become, that phrase from Justice Brennan, has become the standard by which the Constitution is turned into a living document, a Constitution that no longer can constitute. A Constitution has, as Justice Scalia has said, an anti-evolution purpose. The very virtue of a Constitution is that it is not changeable. It exists to prevent change, to embed certain rights so that they cannot easily be taken away. Madison said rights pre-exist government. Wilson said government exists to dispense whatever agenda of rights suits its fancy and to annihilate, regulate, or attenuate, or dilute those others. Madison said 
the rights we are owed are those that are necessary for the individual pursuit of happiness. Wilson and the progressives said the rights you deserve are those that will deliver material happiness to you and spare you the strain and terror of striving. The result of this is now clear. We see in the rampant indebtedness of our country and the European countries what someone has called a gluttonous feast on the flesh of the future. We see the infantilization of publics that become inert and passive, waiting for the state to take care of them. One statistic, 50% of all Americans 55 years old or older have less than $50,000 in savings and investment. The feast on the flesh of the future is what debt is. To get a sense of the size of our debt. In 1916, midway in Woodrow Wilson's first term, the richest man in America, John D. Rockefeller, could have written a personal check and retired the national debt. Today, the richest man in America, Bill Gates, could write a personal check for all his worth and not pay two months' interest on the national debt. Five years from now, interest debt service will consume half of all income taxes. Ten years from now, the three main entitlements, Medicare, Medicare, and Social, Medicaid, and Social Security, plus interest, will consume 93% of all federal revenues. Twenty years from now, debt service interest will be the largest item in the federal budget. Calvin Coolidge, the last president with whom I fully agreed, <laughs> once said, that when you see a problem coming down the road at you, relax, nine times out of 10, it will go into the ditch before it gets to you. <laughs> he was wrong about the one we now face. We are facing the most predictable financial crisis, most predictable social and political crisis of our time. And all the political class can do is practice what I call the politics of assuming a ladder. It's about the it's an old famous story of two people walking down the road. One's an economist, the other's a normal American. And they fall into a pit with very steep sides. And the normal American at the bottom says, good Lord, we can't get out. The economist said, not to worry, we'll just assume a ladder. <laughs> this seems to me what the, is the only approach they have to the Ponzi nature of our own welfare state. I think what it is time for us to understand that the, the model that we share in a somewhat attenuated form so far with Europe simply cannot work. It is that on the one hand, we should tax the rich, AKA the investing and job creating class, yet count on spending the revenues of investment and job creation. No one has explained to the political class that it is very dangerous to try to leap a chasm in two bounds. <laughs> we are now being told that a value-added tax is going to be required. Well, a value-added tax would help the political class to shower benefits on those who can vote for them while taxing people who can't vote for them. The beauty of the value-added tax is it taxes everybody, but nobody quite notices it. We are going to come now to a time when America is going to have to revisit Madison's Federalist Paper 45 and his statement, the powers delegated by the proposed constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Few and defined. The cost of not facing this fact, of not enforcing the doctrine in some sense of enumerated powers is that big government inevitably breeds bigger government. James Q. Wilson, one of the great social scientists in American history, put it this way. Once politics was about only a few things, today it is about nearly everything. Once the legitimacy barrier has fallen, political conflict takes a very different form. New programs need not await the advent of a crisis of extraordinary majority because no program is any longer new. It is seen rather as an extension, a modification, or an enlargement of something the government is already doing. Since there is virtually nothing the government has not tried to do, there is little that it cannot be asked to do. 
And so we have today's death spiral of the welfare state, an ever larger government resting on ever smaller tax base, government impeding the creation of wealth in order to enforce the redistribution of it. We're not fooling, however, the American people. The Wall Street Journal this morning announced with a sort of breathless surprise that about 80% of the American people disapprove of Congress, raising a fascinating question. Who are the 20%? <clears throat> it is a sign of national health that the Americans still think about Washington the way they used to talk about the old Washington senator's baseball team when, this, when the saying was Washington first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League. Back then they were run, senators were, by a man named Clark Griffith who said, the fans like home runs, and we have assembled a pitching staff to please our fans. <laughs> that is why the American people do not mind what they are instructed by their supposed betters to mind, that is the so-called problem of gridlock. Ladies and gentlemen, gridlock is not an American problem, it is an American achievement. When, when James Madison and 54 other geniuses went to Philadelphia in the sweltering summer of 1787, they did not go there to design an efficient government. The idea would have horrified them. They wanted a safe government, to which end they filled it with blocking mechanisms. Three branches of government, two branches of the legislative branch, veto, veto, override, supermajorities, judicial review. And yet, I can think of nothing the American people have wanted intensely and protractedly that they did not eventually get. The world understands a world most of whose people live under governments they wish were capable of gridlock, that we always have more to fear from government speed than government tardiness. We are told, <laughs> we are told that one must not be a party of no. To no, I say an emphatic yes. <laughs> For two reasons. The reason that almost all improvements make matters worse is that most new ideas are false. Second, the most beautiful five words in the English language are the first five words of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law. <laughs> no law abridging freedom of speech. No law establishing religion. No law interfering with the right to assemble to petition for redress of grievance. And the Bill of Rights goes on a litany, a tissue of no's. No unreasonable searches and seizures. No uh, no cruel and unusual punishments, and so it goes. The American people are, I think, healthier than they are given credit for. They have only one defect. We have nothing to fear right now but an insufficiency of fear itself. <laughs> it is time for a wholesome fear of what people are trying to do. We have few allies. We don't have Hollywood. We don't have academia. We don't have the mainstream media, but we have two things. First, we have arithmetic is on our side. <laughs> the numbers do not add up and cannot be made to do so. Second, we have the Cato Institute. <laughs> the people in this room are what the Keynesians call a multiplier. <laughs> and for once, they are right. In Athens, the so-called cradle of democracy, the demos, a Greek word, the people, have been demonstrating in recent days the degradation that attends uh, people who become state broken to a fault, who become crippled by dependency and the infantilization that comes with it. Well, we shall see. I think America is organized around the very principle of individualism, which I can best illustrate with what I promise you is the last baseball story. True story. Uh, Rogers Hornsby was at the plate, the greatest right-handed hitter in the history of baseball and a 
rookie who was on the mound who was quite reasonably petrified. The rookie threw three pitches that he thought were on the edge of the plate, but the umpire said, ball one, ball two, ball three. The rookie got flustered and shouted in at the umpire, those were strikes. The umpire took off his mask, looked out at the rookie and said, young man, when you throw a strike, Mr. Hornsby will let you know. <laughs> Hornsby had become the standard of excellence. If he didn't swing, it wasn't a strike. We want a country in which everyone is encouraged to strive to be his own standard of excellence and have the freedom to pursue it. Now, there are reasons for being downcast at the moment. Certain recent elections have not gone so well. Let me remind you of something, again, going back to 1964. In 1964, the liberal candidate got 90% of the electoral votes. Eight years later, the liberal candidate got 3% of the electoral votes. This is a very changeable country. I would recall the words to you of the uh, first Republican president, who two years before he became president spoke at the Wisconsin State Fair with terrible clouds of civil strife lowering over the country. Lincoln told his audience the story of the oriental despot who summoned his wise men and assigned them to go away and come back when they had devised a statement to be carved in stone, to be forever in view and forever true. They came back ere long and the statement they had carved in stone was, this too shall pass away. How consoling in times of grief, said Lincoln, how uh, how chastening in times of pride. And yet, said Lincoln, if we cultivate the moral world within us as prodigiously as we Americans cultivate the physical world around us, it need not be true. Lincoln understood that freedom is the basis of values. It's not the alternative to a values approach to politics. Freedom is the prerequisite for the moral dimension to flower. Given freedom, the American people will flower. Given the Cato Institute, the American people will have, in time, secure freedom. Thank you very much, and thank you for your help to Cato.